Because one may affect your decision with the other, and we want to be aware and be able to work with all of us. Could we stand together at this time? We're going before the Lord in prayer as we begin our service, and we're asking the power of the Holy Ghost to be manifest in everything that we do. The God we serve is the God over every situation. He's the God of power. He's the God of healing. He is the God of every situation. Let's go before Him right now as we begin our service. Mighty God, we do love you. Lord Jesus, we're grateful for the opportunity that you have afforded us to be in this house. God, you've been so good to me. God, you've been so good to my family. God, you are the merciful God. Now, Lord, you know every individual in this house. I pray that you would let your power reach down and touch us. Lord, fill us. Lord, move us. Lord, let us be willing to answer your call. God, for all this, we praise you. Now, everybody, give Jesus a clap offering of praise. Give him high praise in this house tonight.
Jesus in this house. I said there's nobody like Jesus. I said there's nobody like Jesus. We preached about it today. We sing about it tonight. There's just nobody like our Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you would remain standing, I'd like for all of our ministers and elders to please make their way to the front. We're going to the Lord in prayer at this moment in our service. We want to take every need and every request. There will be names listed on the media board who have sent requests to us. I would bring this special requests or requests before the church. I'd like for us to be in special prayer uh, for Sister Amy Farmer. Uh, she had surgery today, had hip replacement, and uh, I talked to her by text this afternoon, and uh, she is recovering, but asked the church family to be praying for her. And while she was in the hospital, yes, she did test positive for COVID. So we're praying for her in all of those instances. And then I would like for the church family uh, to please be in prayer for our fellow church families, uh, for the church in Harriman. I will be praying for them. They had an untimely fire in their main sanctuary uh, because of lightning. And we're praying that God will bless them. And... Uh, provide for them and we're also praying for many of the church families uh, from uh, the church in Pound, Virginia Brother Hogg is the pastor several of the families of that church uh, understand lost their homes and the flooding that's taken place so we're praying for all of them if you have a need tonight an unspoken request would you make it known by the uplifted hand if you have a need for the elders to fulfill James 5 14 if you would make your way to the front at this time the elders and ministers are here to pray for you that you can receive what you need from the Lord as they pray for you let's all pray together mighty God we love you Savior we come before you tonight bringing every need and every request Lord we pray for all the names that have been lifted all the hands that have been raised Lord we pray a special prayer of healing and touch God, we know that you are in control of every situation, every life. Savior, we pay, pray for Pastor Anthony as he ministers in Germany this week. God, I pray that you would give him souls for his labors and keep him safe when he journeys home. God, now I pray that your power would be manifest in the remainder of this service. Lord, your word tells us that by your stripes we're healed, and we're claiming that healing tonight. Those who are sick in body, who cannot be in your house, we pray that you administer to them right now. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.
Come on and lift up your praise in this house. Oh, let your kingdom fall. Love him. Love him. Worship him. Clap your hands. All you people, make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Worship the Lord. God bless you. You may uh, be seated. And Jacob went out from Bathsheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillars and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all the places where thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awake out of the sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. He was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate to heaven, of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stones and he had put up for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in his ways that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Jacob had a dream, and he said, This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate to heaven. According to Jacob, the house of God is the gate to heaven. So you and I are in the gate to heaven on which angels are ascending and descending. And may I say, I think it is incumbent upon us to take care of the gate to heaven that God has assigned us to. And if you look around this place, does, has anybody noticed the parking lot, how beautiful it looks? With, it's been resealed. And Go ahead and give a clap offering. And wait till you see the school cafeteria. You talk about beautiful new floors. It just looks so gorgeous. And I, I've noticed all around this place, they're upgrading, shining up, fixing up, remodeling. And uh, Sister McCool and I have talked about, we've seen so many business places that age, they just allow it to uh, gradually go down. And we don't ever want that to happen to the house of God. And our pastor will staff under the leadership of Pastor uh, Mark and Sister Jamie McCool. They're certainly not letting that happen around here. They're keeping everything, not just this building, but throughout this building. And we thank God for that. Let our ushers come forward right now. Jacob, when he saw all of that, he said, the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. And this is none other than the house of God. And it is the gate to heaven. And we're going to take care of the house of God because it's the gate to heaven. If you'd stand to your feet with us. Then Jacob made a promise to God. Said, if everything you give me, I'm going to give you a tenth. And he even went further than that in Malachi about 
an offering along with the tithe. And that's what we're doing. We are supporting the work of God. Father, we do thank you tonight for your blessings and your goodness. We're thankful for the ministry of this church. We ask you again, Lord, to bless Brother Anthony in Germany and where he is ministering. Give him many souls for his labor. I pray, O oh God, that you will give us a spirit of giving. May we give liberally and cheerfully. Lord, I pray you will reward each one for their giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone march, and we'll march out the right side of our pew and back in the opposite end. If you don't have any money to give, march anyway. March by faith. The next time you will have it, God will bless you.
I believe revival's already here. I believe it's already here. We just got to jump into it and say, Lord, just continue revival. We baptize one in Jesus' name right after our morning service. I think we should give the Lord praise for that right now. Come on, revival's not coming. It's already here. Hallelujah. Won't you clap your hands unto the Lord? Come on, somebody, clap your hands. I don't want, I'm not talking a golf clap. I'm talking about praise that he's worthy of. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can start making your way back to your seat. Just continue standing when you get there and get your Bibles. My, what a word we heard today. There's none unlike unto the Lord. He is all by himself God. And pastor, what an eloquent, eloquent, powerful word we heard today. I'm thankful for our leadership. I'm thankful for our pastor. Aren't you thankful for your pastor tonight? Amen. 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 Once you get your Bibles, go with me to Hosea chapter number eight. I want to talk about my favorite thing tonight. And I hope to encourage you, to challenge you, inspire you to see what I see from the word of the Lord. Hosea chapter number eight. We're going to look at verse number 11. Then we'll look at verse number 12. When you're there, would you say amen? amen? If you're cheating, looking at the screen, say amen. amen. It's all right. It's all right. As long as you get there, you're there, right? Yeah. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. Look at verse 12. He said, I have written to him the great things. Someone said the great things. The great things of my law. But they were counted as a strange thing. Thing. Someone say strange thing. Tonight, I want to draw my subject, my title from verse number 12. Strange things. Strange things. I want you to put your Bibles down, lift up your hands, and I want you to pray one more time. I want you to pray the Lord would inspire you tonight from his word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for the services we've had over the last several weeks and how you have moved, you have ministered, you have touched. But I pray, Lord, that you would help me tonight to teach, preach from your word, that I would be a vessel for you tonight with your anointing, that you might speak to someone, inspire someone from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Won't you clap your hands unto the Lord tonight? Look at somebody and tell them strange things. Strange things. You could be seated. Strange things. The theme of Hosea's prophetic book is simply summed up in two words, spiritual adultery. The context of this portion of Hosea is in the midst of God's accusation against Israel. God's people had broken their covenant with him and they had gone after other gods. Israel had selected kings without God's approval and built idols out of gold and silver. With such behavior, they had sowed the wind and reaped the whirlwind. Not least among God's judgments was this statement. I have written to him, speaking of Israel, he's calling them Ephraim in this moment, the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Not only had Israel spurned faithfulness, true worship, and God-given authority, they had rejected God's word. The root of Israel's spiritual adultery was their repudiation of Scripture. And without God's word, they were doomed to disobey him. Can I tell you this? You cannot have true worship without Scripture. Jesus said in John 4 that they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And you can't have spiritual fidelity without the word of God. And so as long as Israel had forsaken God's word, they were sentenced to failure. Likewise, such an outcome is inevitable for the Christian as they neglect their Bibles. Listen to me tonight. No doubt there are Christians that believe the word of God is important. But as long as their belief does not lead them to read and study the word of God, then their professed belief is nothing more than unbelief. 
you can say amen right there. As long as their belief, we know that the word of God is important, that we should read it, that we study it. But if you don't do it, then really what you're saying is unbelief. To call yourself a Christian and neglect reading scripture is backwards and your life will not be upright, but it will be upside down. I want to stir you up this evening for the word of God. It's my desire for you to hunger for the meat of God's word and to thirst for the milk of God's word. So let's look at this text from verse number 12 of Hosea 8. Look at the first phrase here. He says, I have written to him. So why should Christians study, read, and obey scripture? First and foremost, because God is the author of scripture. Though many men from different times pen the words of Scripture, there is but one author. 2 Peter 1.21 says this, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So God is the author of all of the books of the Bible. Scripture is 66 inspired books with a cohesive, redemptive theme all inspired of God. Now Moses may have written history and law, but it was God who guided the pen. David and Solomon may have composed beautiful psalms, prose, and proverbs, but it was God who guided the pen. The prophets may have uttered prophetic messages of judgment and promises, but it was God who guided the pen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John may have recorded the life and ministry of Christ, but it was God who guided the pen. Paul may have masterfully written theological expositions, but it was God who guided the pen. Men spoke and wrote, but they were carried along or moved along by the Holy Ghost. Every word, sentence, and page of Scripture is inspired of God. Paul wrote Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture. Someone say all scripture. What does the word all mean? The word all means all, everything, everything that is written. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. There's nothing that scripture doesn't touch in your life. The word of God touches every part of man. From his mind to his heart to his spirit to his complete body to his relationships to his career to his money. Everything the word of God touches. All of scripture is breathed out not by me but by God. Postmodern celebrity pastors may want to quote unquote unhitch themselves and their churches from the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is just as inspired as the New Testament. The Old Testament may seem strange because it declares God as the creator of the heavens and the earth, but it's true nonetheless. The Old Testament may seem strange because it records miracles, signs, and wonders, but it is trustworthy despite the contrary. The Old Testament laws, principles, and precepts may seem antiquated and politically incorrect in comparison with today's standards, but it's true nonetheless. What is strange is that culture has dictated what is considered to be true or not true. Today, the waves of fashion and the whims of fads take precedence over truth. How do you feel? How does it make you feel? Happiness is truth. No, 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 no. The Word of God is true. Relativism has bent truth to mean whatever is true for you may not be true for me or speak your truth and let me speak my truth. Brothers and sisters, that is not truth. That is your opinion. And your opinion can change depending upon your feelings and your feelings are fickle, but the word of God shall stand forever. The word of God is not based on your feelings. It's not based upon your emotions. We have a sure word of prophecy. A sure word. When your feelings are out of whack, you can go back to the word and find a sure word. Oh, you're not hearing me tonight. Psalm 18 and 30, this God, his way is perfect. And the word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. You don't take refuge in your emotions. You take refuge in the word. Oh, you're not hearing me. I'll, I'll keep going, okay? 
Psalm 119, 15, but you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Everything written in this book is true. Jesus said this in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Word has sanctifying power. You want to know how you can grow in holiness? Get in this book. You want to know how you can grow in worldliness? Listen to the world. But I've come to tell somebody tonight that the word of God is true and it's perfect. And if you'll dig into this book, you'll be a blessed person. Oh, you're not... Uh, I'm telling you, the Word of God will help you. The Word of God will bless you. The Word of God will bring you favor in your life. The Word of God will bring you victory, but you got to open up its pages and read yourself silly and say, Lord, thy Word is truth. Sanctify me in your truth. Truth has liberating power. John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But truth doesn't care about your feelings. Somebody said that a long time ago. Truth will make you free, though. And what you need is the Word of God to constantly be there, give you a sure foundation. When the world is being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, you can go back to the book and find truth. Today may be considered postmodern, post-truth. But we will never be post-Scripture. You didn't hear me. I'm going to say it again. We may be post-modern, post-truth, but we shall never be post-Scripture. Scripture is what we stand upon, for its author is God. If God is true, then let every man and his subjective opinion be a liar. For it is impossible for God to lie. He changes not. So if his word was true 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago, it's true in 2022. It's true. Uh, I'm telling you, if you want to know truth, get in the book. The grass withers, the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached unto you. For Scripture to be truth and its author truthful, then we can conclude there are no errors in this book. Men in history have tried to find contradictions, errors, and mistakes, but yet it still stands as the inerrant word of God. Scripture's adversaries have come and gone, and yet the Bible endures. Are you hearing me? He said, though, I, I have written unto them. If God is the author of Scripture, that means that it has authority. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the master. He's the author. This is his book, and it has authority. It may have been penned by man, but God guided the pen. These are not just the words of man. These are the very words of God. You want to know how I know it's the very word of God? Because if it was only written by men, we would have painted ourselves in a lot better light. We would have left out David's failures. We would have left out Paul being a murderer. We would have left out Moses saying, I want to give up and quit. We would have left all that out. We would be the heroes of this book. But you realize when you open up the pages of this book, man needs a redeemer. Man needs a savior. And the only perfect man that could do that was Jesus Christ, who was the word of God made flesh. I'm telling you, it's the word of God that will bring you truth. It will set you free. Does anybody believe that tonight, that the Word of God is still great? It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my... If you believe that, won't you clap your hands unto the Lord and thank Him for His Word. Woo. I want to get you fired up for the Word. Look at the next phrase. The great things of my law. So I have written unto them the great things of my law. What we find in a God-inspired scripture are great things. There isn't anything in scripture that is unimportant or insignificant. This is, this is true considering that Jesus said this. He said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill 
For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He's saying every dot, every comma, every semicolon, every cross T, everything in the word of God is important. You say, well, I don't need that today. We don't need that today. Why, why are we being dictated by something that was written 2,000 and 4,000 years ago? Some would have you to believe that there are portions of Scripture that are not important. Ah, you can just skip over that. Just be free and pick and choose what you want. What we try to do with the Word of God, we try to make it a spiritual buffet. You ever been to a buffet? Been to one of those buffets that got a little bit of everything. And a little bit of everything and ain't nothing good on it. They got pizza, they got tacos, they got lasagna, they got orange chicken and, and, so, and sweet and sour chicken. You're like, hey, y'all, what's good here? Everything. Can't be everything. Can't be. So you just go and pick what you want. We, don't, we can't do that with Scripture. Everything in the Word of God is good. Paul said this in Romans. He said, all these things were written for your learning. That through patience and faith that you might have endurance to continue. So these things were written for your endurance. It helps you even though, can I tell you that Leviticus is important? Can I tell you numbers is important? Some of y'all are like, uh, brother mate, I tried numbers in high school. I didn't do so well. That's really not a great title for that book. And it's really not, shouldn't be called Numbers. It should be called the Book of the Wanderings because they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And it's a fantastic book. And so we think we can't read and we can't understand and That's not important. Let me get to the good stuff. Well, all of it is good. He said, it's the great things of my law. It's the great, everything in Scripture is great. Even the things you disagree with. Thomas Jefferson tried to do that. He tried to cut out all of Christ's divinity, miracles, and resurrection, making it called the Jefferson Bible. But a Bible that is devoid of Christ's divinity, miracles, and message is no Bible at all. Beloved, all Scripture is great, even the parts you don't like. Some may try to cut out the doctrines that they may not like, but they will soon find their names removed from the book of life. That's what he said. He said in, the, in his word, he said in Deuteronomy, and he said in Revelation, if anybody would try to remove anything from this book, your name shall be removed. But can I tell you something else? There are those who don't believe that Scripture is sufficient. And so they try to add their traditions. They try to add their preferences to the word of God. But let me tell you what the Lord said. He said, if you try to take something away from it, I'll take your name out of it. But if you try to add one thing to this book, I'll add to you the plagues of this book. And I tell you, the word word of God is great. It's sufficient for everything that we need. We don't have to take anything out of it. We don't have to add anything to it. You know why? Because he's the author. Somebody say amen. amen. All of it is great. All of it is great. But he says this in the next phrase, but they were counted as a strange thing. Strange things. God had given Israel his word, however, it had been neglected because they thought it strange. What a sad treatment of God's word. The word counted in the Hebrew means determined, valued, esteemed, or considered. The word of God had little value for Israel. It's sad what little value we place on scripture today. We hear one or two or three sermons a week. And we feel that it's sufficient enough to go out into this world and find victory. It's not valued. We value other things before Scripture. We nibble on a verse just long enough sometime in the day to soothe our conscience, mark off our checkbox and our daily disciplines. Or to quote Charles Spurgeon, that great prince of preachers, he said this, There is enough dust on your Bibles to write damnation with your fingers. He had a way with words, didn't he? Little value is placed on Scripture in our lives. We get a little time and a little effort because we consider it strange. The word strange used here in the Hebrew means out of the ordinary. Illegitimate or alien. That's what, they, that's what Israel thought of the word of God. 
We're living in strange days. And you know what we need? A great word. If we're going to combat the strangeness and the weirdness and the illegitimate uh, ideas of this word, we need to have a sure foundation of the great things from the word of God. But the issue is we are more familiar with the cultural language of entertainment and politics than we are with Scripture. We are fluent with cultural jargon and unable to comprehend the word of Scripture. There needs to be a hunger for the word of God. But if we are not careful, there will come a famine. Am Amos 8. 11 through 12 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. That is a famine that we do not need right now. What we need, we need to feast on the Word of God more than we feast on the news, social media. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. If anything, we should watch the news and say, that's a strange thing. We should go through social media and go, that's a strange thing. But we should come to the Word of God and say, this is a great thing. This is truth. This is how I'm going to apply my life. To avoid the famine, you must be willing to store up while you have the harvest. You hear me? That's what Joseph did. That's how they, they, they were able to find sustenance during the drought in Genesis. Is that they stored up during the harvest. We have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the Bible. We have an embarrassment of riches. We've got more English translations, study Bibles, and editions than ever before. We've got journaling Bibles. We've got athletic Bibles. We've got uh, police Bibles and firefighter Bibles. You know what these publishers are trying to do? Get you to read the Word. I get this question a lot. Brother Nate, what kind of Bible should I get? And here's my answer. Whatever one you will read. Whichever one will not sit on your nightstand collecting dust, pick up the one that you will get into and you will read. We are in a time of harvest. We better start storing up the word of God in our heart and in our minds because there will be a day. There will be a famine when things will not get right and things will become strange and we'll look for the word of God. And he'll say, listen, I gave you a time of harvest. I gave you all kinds of translations. I gave you all kinds of versions of the Bible and you didn't read it. People arguing about translations, and they don't, they don't even read it. <laughs> Drives me absolutely crazy. Ashley and I went to, in Easton, we went to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, a few months ago, this year. And we went to the Museum of the Bible. And if you've not gone to the Museum of the Bible, you need to go. You need to go there first. Go to the Museum of the Bible. And there is a moving part when we walk through this museum. It's, it's five or six levels. We got through three. That's it. It's, it's, it's amazing. And you get to this part where you look through how we got the Bible, and you need to know how we got the Bible, and know that there are people who died for you to have a Bible in your hand today. And these people, let me just go ahead and just get on my hobby horse here for a second. I, I got some people who I, who I talk to like, oh, we don't like Martin Luther, and we don't like that. We don't like. You wouldn't have a Bible if there was not some of these men who translated it from French and German and got it out of the hands of the popes and got it into the common man's language. People died. There was John Knox, John Wycliffe who gave their blood for you to have a Bible. And you walk through this museum and there's a place you walk into this, this bright white room. And there are shelves all around the room. And it shows you translations of, of the Bible in the language of people around the world. And you can see where translations of the Old Testament has been translated in a foreign tongue. But the New Testament hasn't been translated yet in that tongue. And then you'll find another language that has the old and the new. Then you'll find something that has the new and don't have the old. Then you'll find the majority of the room's languages of the world do not have a a Bible in their language. And we're over here 
fighting and fussing about what translation to read. And there's people in this world who don't even have a Bible. And you want to fuss with me, brothers and sisters? Pick up the Word of God and eat it. Get in the book and read yourself silly. Whatever you will read, do it. We are blessed around here. We are blessed with the Word of God, and we should be thankful. Yeah. Come on, Brother Nate, move on now. Getting in people's preferences now. Sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry. Get in this book, and you won't be sorry. Come on, somebody. There's a famine in the land. Biblical literacy is at an all-time Biblical literacy is at an all-time low. People don't even know where to find the book of Matthew or Genesis. But they can tell you everything about UT football. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is not going to ask you how many touchdowns Peyton Manning had. Oh, yeah. What number did he wear? Oh, yeah. Now tell me, brothers and sisters. Are you hearing me? But now I like when you talk about the Vols like that. I'm, I'm so sorry that we've got too many gods around here. It's not Jesus Christ. And that's keeping, you can tell me you can watch four hours of a football game, but you can't read 30 minutes of the Word of God. No wonder we're weak. No wonder we're constantly getting beat up by the devil. You know why? Because we're not being nourished with the great things of his Word. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Delight in Scripture. When you get to Psalms, the book of Psalms, 150 chapters, the longest chapter in the Bible is found there. It's Psalm 119. That's what we do when somebody gets in trouble at school. You're going to write out Psalm 119. All 5,000 verses of it. Can I just have Psalm 117? It's got like three or something, you know. You get to Psalm 119, you're like, that's, you're, like you're, doing, you're doing so good in your Bible reading. You get me, you're like, I'm checking it off. I'm going there. And all of a sudden, you get to day Psalm 119. And you're like, what time is it? How long is this going to take? And this keeps going and going. But you know what the theme of Psalm 119 is? The longest chapter in the Word of God is about the Word of God. It's about David. Delight. He said, I, I've, got so, I've got so much to say about the word of God. I delight in the word of God. David's heart was delighted in the words of God. He just kept on bringing praise to the word. To David, the word of God was not strange. It was great. The doctrines, the laws, the precepts were, thought, were not thought to be alien and foreign or strange, but they were considered great. He made this prayer, Psalm 119 and 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. The word law is used over and over again. It's in reference to the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Everything there is considered great. He says, oh, your wondrous laws. He says, thy testimonies are my delight. The word testimonies is used in reference to when the law was placed in or near the Ark of the Covenant. It would signify its witness. Then he would say, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. The word precepts is drawn from the sphere of an officer, overseer, one who has the responsibility to look into a matter closely. God's word looks into the matter of man and shows us our flaws and our weaknesses and shows us the remedy only found in Jesus Christ. He talks about statues and commandments, things that we need, ordinances, rules, judgments. He constantly is referring to the word of God and saying, I delight in thy word. He says this in verse 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth to David he would rather have God's word than wealth Psalm 119 72 the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver verse 127 therefore I love thy commandments above gold yea above fine gold he loves God's word more than he loves sleep he says in verses 147 through 148 I prevented the dawning of the morning and I cried, I hoped in thy word. 
Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate on thy word. That's what God wants to do in you. He wants to stir up that love and delight for his word. Can I tell you the word of God will help you wherever you are in life? It will help you. Know, I mean, I've heard Bishop talk about this over the last 12 years, how he'll say there's this, he'll come to a circumstance or an issue and the Lord will, will just awaken or quicken his mind to something from the word of God. And when you dig in the word of God like Bishop has done, the Lord will begin to quicken you. Jesus said this. He said this. The comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, will teach you or remind you of all things that I have taught unto you. Meaning he will bring into your mind things from the word of God to fight and to face the circumstances that you're, that you're coming against. But can I tell you, he can't bring to your remembrance what you don't put in your brain. He can't stir up into remembrance what you don't put in your mind. You have to feed on the word of God so you can draw from the well of his riches and so you can face your circumstances. He says this, you can avoid some bad friends if you get in the word. Psalm 119, 115, he says, depart from me, you evildoers. Oh, for I will keep the commandments of my God. When you have the word of God dictating your relationships, you'll avoid a lot of harm. If you'll place your trust in the word of God, it'll keep you from a lot of bad relationships. How can a young man keep his way pure? How can you fight for holiness if you're a young man in a day where sin and evil is running rampant? Psalm 119 and 9, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto unto thy word. How can you keep yourself from being offended? I got the answer. 165, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing. What's that word nothing mean? Nothing. Nothing shall offend them. You know why so many people get so offended all the time? They don't love the word of God. They're always so sensitive to what everybody's thinking about them, what they say. Oh, they're posting that about me, aren't they? I just know they are. No, they're not. They're just posting a nice little picture. They didn't have anything on you in mind. But if you would get the word in your heart, you'll say, well, isn't that a nice picture? Isn't that a nice what you And just keep going on your way. Nothing shall offend them. What if you've gone astray from God? Verse 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant. For I do not forget thy commandments. What if you are facing persecution and tribulation? There's a verse for that. Psalm 119, 153, consider mine affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. How can you learn to hate evil? Psalm 119, 128, therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. How can you learn to fight against sin? Verse number 11 of Psalm 119. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Stand to your feet. How can you become a person of praise? Verse 17, that same chapter. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statues. Who wants to be blessed in the house tonight? Who wants to be blessed? Who wants their marriage blessed? Who wants their finances blessed? Who wants their children blessed? Who wants their job blessed? Psalm 119 and 56 says this, this blessing has fallen to me. <laughs> that I have kept your precepts. Verse 2, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Brothers and sisters, the word of God is not strange. It's great. The word of God is not strange. It's great. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story as musicians and singers are coming up here, and I'm just going to share with you where I'm coming from tonight, okay? Now, I grew up in church. I had a drug problem when I was growing up. Mom drugged me to church on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Sunday morning and Sunday night, camp meeting. We, we'd go to church. I mean, she, she drugged me all the way down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to go to church. She drugged me all the way to Akron, Ohio to go to church. 
I went to church a lot. I grew up at church. Went to Sunday school in church. Uh, I went. I, did, I mean, I did everything in church. But I'll never forget this moment I had when I was about 13 or 14 years old. I can't remember how old I was, but our church was the church that I grew up in was having a a sectional rally, kind of like what we do here in the tri-state. And we had a big crowd at our church, and I was getting to play drums for the praise team and the choir and all the things. And you know what you do is when you get done and you come off the platform, you go get you a drink of water. You know, you go get that drink of water, and you take a look out in the crowd and see who's there. Especially when you're 14 years old, you're looking to see if somebody special's there for you that night, you know. I also never forget, I went and got me a drink of water, and I walked to the door frame to the sanctuary, and I heard the preacher. He took the pulpit, and I heard him begin to read his text. And he read his text, and he was like, I can't remember the exact text, but he was like, Matthew chapter number 19, verse number 1. And then he went, now I want you to go to Psalm 150 and verse 2. Now I want you to jump over with me to Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 4. Then I want you to come over here to me with, with me over here to Revelation chapter number 20. And I just remember, he hadn't even told his title yet. And I was standing in the doorframe of the, of, the, of the sanctuary, and I just will never forget this moment that I thought, why is the Bible put together like that? Well, I, I just don't understand why he's going kind of hopscotching over this and this. And I just never forget this, this moment I had where I thought, I'll never understand the word of God. I'll never understand it. I'll never be able to read it or understand it. I just felt so uh, deflated and defeated at that moment. Even though I grew up in church, had the Holy Ghost, got baptized, I was so intimidated with this book. It can be pretty intimidating. It's a pretty large book. Skip ahead several, several years and felt this call to preach, to minister. And I was just ready, man. I was like, I want to I go win the world. I'm going to... I'm going to set this world on fire with gospel of Jesus. What he's done for me, and I'm going to tell everybody. And I, f I, knew, I knew things had changed in my life when I felt the sudden urge to read. I like picture books. I had, you know, magazine subscriptions, and I liked all the pictures. You know, I read the articles here and there. But, I, you know, I really knew God got a hold of me when all of a sudden I thought, I'd like to read a book. I thought, well, I better start with the Word of God. I want to share. I'm going to be honest with you. I went to go read the, the, my, the, my Bible. I thought, where am I going to start? Where should I start? I thought, I'm going to start in the New Testament, Matthew. That's where I'm going. I'm going to start with Matthew. I may have told this before, and if I have, I'm, I apologize. I read Matthew, and Jesus has uh, been born. He, he heals the sick. He dies on the cross, and he's resurrected on the third day. And then he's going to ascend at the end of Matthew 28. And I'm going, now hold on. This is a whole lot of information in one, one little book. What's Mark going to be about? He, I mean, Matthew, he gave it all away. What's, Mark, what's chapter 2 going to be about? I thought Matthew was chapter 1, Mark was chapter 2, Luke was chapter 3, and John was chapter 4. And I began to cry because I didn't know how to read my Bible. And I believe that there are people who've got the Holy Ghost, you've been baptized, you've seen God do great things in your life, but you're intimidated by that book and you feel like, I just don't know how to read it. Can I tell you, I felt the same way. I was not born a preacher. Just ask this beautiful woman over here. God knows she prayed it into existence. I kept my mother on her knees praying. I wasn't born a preacher. I didn't come out of the womb talking in tongues. Acts 2, 38. I didn't, that wasn't me. But when God got a hold of me, he put something in me for this book. And I decided right then, I said, okay, Lord, I don't understand how this is all put together yet, but I'm going to give my life to this book. I'm going to give my life to this book. I'll read it over and over and over and over and over again until I understand it. And can I tell you something? Some 17 years later, I still don't understand everything in this book. 
But I, I want to tell you, every time I open it, he speaks something to me. It's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Come on, somebody. If you want to know how to do it, just open up and read. Take it up and read. That's all you have to do. I'm closing. They're going to sing. I'm going to get out of the way. It might seem strange to you. I know it definitely seems strange to this world. They're trying everything in this world to discredit this book. Ah, it's antiquated. It's old-fashioned. Why do we need to have old men who are dead long ago and tell us how to live today in this century? Modern man's more advanced. We're smarter. I'm going to tell you something. God's Word endures forever. It's true today, just as it was 2,000 or 4,000 years ago. His word is still good. But what you have to do is take it up and read. But you have to have a hunger for it. So I want us to pray this prayer right now. Father, as your eyes are closed, I want you to pray, Father, I pray that you would stir up within me a desire for your word. There might be some people in this room who felt like me 17 some years ago and I got through the book of Matthew and I had no idea what would come next. I was so confused and I was overwhelmed and I felt inadequate and I felt insufficient and I felt like I would never make any difference in anybody's life or even my own life. But God, you stirred something within me for your word. And if you can do it for me, if you can do it for somebody like me, if you can do it for some heathen like me, you can do it for somebody in this room. I wonder if you would lift up your hands right now and say, maybe if you're honest, if you're honest with yourself and say, Lord, I'm not given, I've not given your word enough adequacy and time in my life and I really need to do something. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling anxious and worried all the time. I'm always being defeated. I'm always feeling overcome and overwhelmed. Lord, I need the word. I need the sword of the spirit so I can take it up and wield it. But if I can't take it up and read, I'll never find victory. But I pray right now, Lord, that you would stir it up with somebody. I wonder there be some young man or some young woman right now who say, you know what, Brother Nate, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give my life to the word of God. I'm going to give my life to read it. Is there somebody who will do that and say, I'll try. I'll try. So if I have to read it on my iPad, if I have to read it on my iPhone. If I have to borrow somebody else's Bible, I'm going to I want to give my life to the Word of God. Maybe there's some saint, a seasoned saint. You've been here a long time. You've had the Holy Ghost for decades, and you're just, you just still feel overwhelmed with the Word of God. I want to tell you, He will help you if you will try. He will give you a burden and a hunger for His Word if you will try. I'm telling you, it's line upon line. It's precept upon precept. It's it's here a little, there a little. All it takes is consistency and discipline. I wonder now if somebody would come who say, Lord, I'm thankful, I'm grateful for the Word of God. You've preserved it, you've kept it, it's sufficient for me, and I'm going to live it. I'm going to obey it. I'm going to give my life to it. It's not strange to me. It's not foreign to me. It's great things. It's great things.
Scripture tells us in that same passage, Psalms 119, you heard it. For thy word is what? A lamp unto my feet. You heard it. He's a light to my path. Listen, we're in a dark world. We are living in a dark, dark world. You, when, when you think it can't get any darker, figuratively speaking, in this world, you can't see your hand in front of your face. That's why so many folks are tripping over so many goofy things. If you look what humanity is being tempted by, they got to be walking in the dark to trip over all the stuff that the enemy is placing in humanity's way. But if you've got the word, <laughs> the psalmist said, it's a lamp to my feet. I can see in this dark world. It's a light to my path. Thank you, Pastor Whitley, for reminding us the importance of being in the word. Now, it's one thing to hear it and say amen. It's another thing to go do it. Have your daily devotion. Have your time in the Word. Be thankful that you have the revelation of the Word and you have the opportunity. We're without excuse. Let's take advantage of it. Lord bless you, First Apostolic Church. Again, please remember, this coming Friday, we're going to Youth Rally in Dandridge. We would like to be able to take the bus if there are enough folks that are needing to ride the bus. I realize that the COVID uptick is affecting many, and we're going to endure that. I ask everyone to be safe and be comfortable the way you greet, and as well as uh, whether we have enough to ride the bus will depend on numbers. So please think about it, pray about it, see what your plans are between now and Wednesday night. We're going to take some official numbers on Wednesday night from the Bible class, from adultish, from P180. And if we have enough that need to ride the bus, we'll be taking the bus. It would leave at 6.30 to head to the rally. So please keep that in mind. Be here Wednesday night for Wednesday night Bible study and worship in the Word. Lord bless you. Greet everyone as your personal protocol makes you comfortable. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.